choose, you can become a distributor of the magazine, even sell them yourself in your own place of business, or just hand them out to people to wake people up. So pick up this month's edition of the InfoWars magazine, June 2014. It talks about the death of the internet. Don't let people sucker you into believing that Obama killed Osama because that's not how it happened. And uh, we'll be right back after this break with a big update on the Bo Bergdahl situation. Stay tuned. It's InfoWars Nightly News. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. Um, I just, over the break, I was thinking about this. Really do encourage you to pick up this month's subscription to the InfoWars magazine. It talks about the death of the internet and why someday when you wake up, it may not be the same internet that you used to know, the internet that you grew up with, uh, the internet that's been with you from the beginning. It will be a different type of cold, hard, meaner internet that doesn't let you search for information like you used to. Now, moving on. Today on the Alex Jones Show, uh, Alex and J Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs, Leanne McAdoo, even Steve Pachinik got in on the um, Bo Bergdahl situation. Is he a hero? Is he a deserter, as it was said on the Drudge Report today? Well, I'm just going to go over four clips, and then we have a report at the end from Leanne McAdoo um, about this situation and kind of all the different facets in it. The first one's from Alex, talking about why he thinks this doesn't really add up. Three days after the White House inadvertently blew the cover, yeah, right, of the CIA's top officer in Kabul, President Obama on Wednesday said his administration is committed to effective intelligence gathering and protecting sources and methods abroad. <clears throat> and again, not that this story in and of itself is that important unless you use it to learn how things really work. And a first approximation of this, looking at it this weekend, the Bo Bergdahl uh, Army story, who's been in captivity for almost five years, supposedly, looks like an infiltration operation where you purposefully claim you've defected to the Taliban and then they don't trust you, they grab you and then you're a quasi prisoner and then you act like you've got Stockholm syndrome and that you basically uh, join them and then you have the dad with his Twitter uh, reportedly and it looks like it's his real Twitter, it's not verified but it's been operating for years saying you know, we, you know people will pay for the death of Afghan children and uh, growing a big beard and all the rest of it. Uh, the whole thing stinks to high heaven. All right, and this next clip has got Joe Biggs talking about how he thinks he wasn't captured as what the official narrative is and that he actually walked off base because he had been talking about it before in his writings, uh, in confidence with other people, and here's that clip. He walked off the base and didn't even think, all right, I'm gonna get my head chopped off. The Haqqani Network is known as the Sopranos of Afghanistan. This next clip deals with the father, who is a 20 plus year veteran of the Postal Service and decided to learn to speak Pashtun. Uh, Joe talks about how when he goes into his accent, the things that he saw that a lot of other people who have not been to Afghanistan probably wouldn't even notice. Well, the, the funny thing though is about his father. He is a US Postal Service worker and had been for 20 something years. The fact that he speaks Pashtun in a very perfect dialect I don't know many people in Idaho who probably speak Pashtun, but I think it's kind of odd that this man speaks it to the T. I mean, just his, the way he sounded, the way he said everything was spot on from what I heard when I was in Afghanistan. So I think there's a little what something behind him. In this last clip from today's show, which I encourage you to go watch the entire exchange between Alex and Joe and their investigation into this matter, uh, talks about a tweet that was deleted off of Bo Bergdahl's dad's uh, Twitter account. When I got uh, when I got to Bob uh, Bergdahl's account, the Twitter account, I saw that tweet, and I saw it right before it got deleted. He says, "I'm still working to free all Guantanamo prisoners. God will repay for the death of every Afghan child." Amen. Well, Bo's father is supposed to be a devout Christian, so the fact that he misspells "Amen," I found that to be a little weird too, as well. But immediately they took that tweet down. And I find that, you know, that's, that in itself right there is a little shady too. So once again, I encourage you to go check out the full uh, show today and you can see for yourself all the questions that we're asking that aren't being asked by the mainstream media. Uh, we're gonna go to a, a final short report here from Leanne McAdoo and she's detailing the people that are going to be released from this prisoner exchange swap that was done with Obama and Mr. Bo Bergdahl.
Obama was willing to pay a steep price in exchange for Army Sergeant Bo Bergdahl. The Guantanamo Five are top Taliban commanders, and the group has tried to free them for more than a decade. According to a 2008 Pentagon dossier on Guantanamo Bay inmates, it was disclosed by WikiLeaks, all five men released were considered to be a high risk to launch attacks against the U.S. and its allies if they were liberated. Mullah Mohammed Fazl is Taliban's former deputy defense minister and is wanted by the United Nations for his role in massacres targeting Afghans' Shiite Muslim population. Mullah Narula Nori was a senior Taliban military figure directly subordinate to Taliban's supreme leader, Mullah Amar. Nori led troops against U.S. and coalition forces and is also wanted by the U.N. for possible war crimes, including the murder of thousands of Shiites. Abdul Haq Wasik is a former deputy minister of intelligence. At one point, he tried to cooperate with U.S. forces in Afghanistan, asking for a GPS system as well as a special radio to communicate with the U.S. military after the invasion in 2001. His dossier says that while he was deputy intelligence minister, he was a crucial liaison between the Taliban and other Islamic fundamentalist groups. Mohammed Nabi Omari held several military leadership posts for the Taliban. He helped organize the al-Qaeda and Taliban militias that fought against U.S. and coalition troops in the first year of the war. Nabi maintained weapons caches and supported extremist activities by smuggling fighters and weapons. Nabi maintains strong ties to active networks. Khair Ula Karikwa a former Taliban governor of Herat was considered by the Pentagon's 2008 dossier to be a likely heroin trafficker and a major opium drug lord in western Afghanistan. And he likely participated in meetings with Iranian officials after 9-11 to help plot attacks on U.S. forces. The dossier says the detainee claimed to be a longtime friend of Afghanistan's president, Hamid Karzai. According to AfghanistanAnalysts.org, Karikwa is the most senior of the five on the list. He is one of the fraternity of original Taliban who launched the movement in 1994. In other words, he is someone who will still command a great deal of influence and respect among today's insurgents. This week's secret diplomacy was not the first time the U.S. government has engaged the Taliban in an effort to negotiate a prisoner swap for Bergdahl's release. In 2011, State Department officials held a series of meetings with Taliban leaders in Doha. At the time, Dianne Feinstein opposed the swap, saying, These are major Taliban figures. They are not minor people, and they will not be held in maximum security custody. Forget that it won't be Guantanamo, just maximum security custody. And in my view, there's no way of knowing what they may do and what kind of propaganda they may breed. Lawmakers suspected the released Taliban could eventually end up returning to the fight. So what has changed in the last few years? The United States just announced it's winding down the war in Afghanistan to concentrate on emerging terrorist threats elsewhere. The sudden release of these Taliban commanders now will end up replenishing the diminished leadership ranks of the Afghan Taliban. So there you go. It looks like the Taliban are going to be getting some of the worst of the worst back in their ranks and we get one soldier who may or may not have deserted. I'm not saying we know the full answer right now, but we're definitely asking questions that nobody else is gonna ask. We're gonna go to another report here from Jakari Jackson that talks about the uh, references to abortion in the Bible, and then when we come back from break, we're gonna have Joe Biggs sitting down with a neighbor. He's gonna be talking via video Skype with the neighbor of the Bergdals. Stay tuned, it's InfoWars Nightly News. Planned Parenthood has reached a new low. A report has surfaced pointing out that Planned Parenthood says that the Bible actually supports abortion. A letter addressed to clergy reads, Many people wrongfully assume that all religious leaders disapprove of abortion. The truth is that abortion is not even mentioned in Scripture. Well, on the flip side of that same coin, the Bible doesn't specifically mention using an automobile to mow down innocent pedestrians because you're a sex-deprived sociopath. But even the most devout atheists can see that such an action is not justifiable. More to the point, the Bible includes a section called the Ten Commandments. Maybe you've heard of this. One which reads, Thou shall not kill. Some translations say, Thou shall not murder. Either or would apply to abortion. People skeptical of the Bible will point out that there is plenty of violence in its pages, which is true. King David, who probably single-handedly killed the most people in the Bible, lived a life of constant warfare. 
But if you recall, David's campaign started when Goliath came to kill his people. So in self-defense, not murder of convenience, David slew Goliath and waged war against the Philistines. With that said, Planned Parenthood, whose current president says her children's lives began when she gave birth. When do you think life starts? Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's controversial. I don't mm -hmm. know that it's really relevant to, relevant to, the, to the conversation. But, I mean, okay. for me, I'm a mother of three children. Um, mm -hmm. For me, life began when I delivered them. Um, they were part of, they've, they've been probably the most important thing in my life ever since. Mm -hmm. But that was my own personal that's my own personal decision. Planned Parenthood, formerly the American Birth Control League, founded by Margaret Sanger, whose hobbies included long walks in the park, accompanied by the Klan, that Planned Parenthood is now saying that it is the will of Almighty God that you murder your child in the womb. Even though the scriptures clearly read, keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked, but Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person, and all the people shall say, Amen. This is clearly another attack on the word of God, providing itching ears with the doctrine they so desperately want to hear. You can find more reports at Infowars.com. All right, I'm joined tonight with uh, Susan. She is a friend of the Bergdahl family. She knew both parents and the son as well. Susan, how did you know the family? I lived there for a long time. I, I worked in the media myself for over 15 years for the local radio and television station there. And um, I just knew everybody there. I went to a lot of the uh, functions, uh, the uh, business after hours, so on and so forth, and then there again, my daughter went to school with Bo. He was a couple of years younger than her, but everybody, you know, knew everybody in the in the in the valley. So um, I just I just knew them. I mean, tell me a little bit about the family. I mean, from what you know, from you know, you know, your daughter going to school with Bo, and you living there for a long time. What what were the Bergdals like? The Bergdals are very down-to-earth, average country people. Um, James, the housewife, uh, Bo, he was in the construction field. He, uh, they're just good people. They just uh, go to work every day, average uh, country people. So you said he uh, was a construction worker. Uh, did you ever read the article that Michael Hastings published called America's Last Prisoner of War? Did you, did you ever read that? The father said he worked for the UPS for 28 years, so was that, is that not the case then? No, he worked for the UPS, but he started in the construction field with oh, okay. everybody else. That's how I knew him. All right, I just wanted to clarify on that. Okay, yeah, and, that's absolutely correct, yes. And were the, was the family at all religious in any kind of way? Were they very extreme in any kind of religion? You know, I don't think so, and I really don't know, but I don't think so. I think they were just... And when did you notice, or were you still there, when the father began learning Pashtun and started growing out that, you know, that Taliban-like beard? When did that start happening? Well, I got to tell you this, um, now, and this is a fact. Uh, when that, when Bo was captured, of course, the whole valley was devastated. We all got together and we put yellow ribbons around the trees and the posts all throughout the valley for, you know, wanting Bo to come home. There was posters everywhere, planted everywhere until the day that, that Bo was brought home. Well, it was approximately, I want to say, uh, six months afterwards, uh, Bob decided, just like any other father, uh, decided to grow his beard and grow his hair, and, and he was going to let it grow until his son was brought home. It's as simple as that. There was no altercation. There was nothing about that. He just wanted to do that until his son came home. And that's what he did. He grew his hair and his, and his beard. And as far as him speaking Arabic, I think he wanted to learn the language because I think they went over there to Afghanistan, and he wanted to speak it. And he is an intelligent man, so um, he learned it. So you said his father went over there? You know, it, it seems to me like they went over to Afghanistan, but don't quote me, or went over there to the Middle East, I'm not sure. It's just with my experience, you know, you know, I was in the Army, and uh, 
Pashtun is not a very easy language to learn, and it's one of those languages, if you don't have someone to talk to every 